One of the highlights of commencement each year is the opportunity to welcome our honored guest and keynote speaker. I could not be more honored to introduce this year's speaker, Secretary Kay Coles James, to the King's community today. Secretary James is a native of Richmond, Virginia, and was raised by her mother in a housing project in the segregated South. She was one of the first children in Virginia to desegregate the all-white schools and went on to graduate from the historic, historically black Hampton University. As a Christian, Secretary James has spent her career promoting public policies that help to strengthen American families, improve education, and alleviate poverty. She has worked in the administration of four U.S. presidents, serving on the National Commission on Children as the Associate Director of the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy, the Assistant Secretary for Public Affairs at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, and as the Director of the U.S. Office of Personnel Management. In January of this year, she was appointed as the Secretary of the Commonwealth of Virginia by Governor Glenn Yonkin. In addition to her work in government, Secretary James has served on the Virginia State Board of Education as the Dean of the Robertson School of Government at Regent University and as the President of the Heritage Foundation. She, was a, she is a commentator, lecturer, and policy leader and has written a number of books on personal success and growth. She is the wife of Charles James Sr. and the proud mother of three grown children and five grandchildren. Ladies and gentlemen, Class of 2022, please join me in welcoming Secretary Kay Coles James. Good morning. I have to confess that this is probably the 40 or 50th commencement I've done in my lifetime, and every single time I cry when I hear that music. And I was sitting there thinking about why that is so emotional for me, but after spending 40 years in government and public policy, I cannot say to this class what hope you give me to know that you are following with the quality of the education that you have received here and with the content of your character. President Gibson, thank you so much for having me here today. I know my job, and I like to do my job well. And I know that my job this morning is to be short and memorable. I think the shortest and most memorable graduation speech I ever heard was my own. Due to civil unrest, campus disturbances, this is back in the early, well, never mind. <laughs> I didn't get to have a graduation and my diploma was delivered by a mailman who handed it to me with the shortest commencement address, and most memorable ever. And as he handed me my diploma, he said, $1.32 postage due. <laughs> I don't know that I'll be able to top that, but I will try. I also recognize what an honor it is, what a privilege it is to have the opportunity to address you. There are many out there who would like to stand here today, and I want to represent them well. If your mothers were standing here, they would say to you, sweetheart, I'm so proud of you. I love you dearly. Your room is ready. And if you want to come home, please do. <laughs> if your fathers were standing here, they would tell you, you have three months to find a job <laughs> and you need to start paying your own way. If your girlfriend was standing here, she would say, so now, can we get engaged? She might, however, say, this has been nice, but now 
I'm ready to move on and focus on my career. I don't know which one you have, one of the two. <laughs> Your boyfriend might say, it's been nice dating you while we were in college, but according to my five-year strategic plan, it's time for us either to part or to form a permanent coalition. <laughs> if your pastor were here, he would say, let me tell you this. With all that you have learned, with all that's been poured into you, you need to know and understand that to survive in the world out there, you need to make Jesus at the center, core of your life, and I'm not playing. And that's what he wants you to know. Your professors might tell you something like, never stop learning. You know, this is your commencement. You're just beginning. And, you know, education is a lifelong pursuit or something like that. <laughs> but since they gave me the honor and the privilege, I want to share with you what's on my heart this morning. The first thing you need to know is that I am one of those individuals who has the audacity to believe in prayer. And a part of my job is to pray for you, and I want you to know I have. And I will continue to pray for you um, for the rest of, I, I only promise graduates a year, uh, <laughs> because then I have another class and I have to start with them. I know that you are intellectually strong and sound, and I know that you are current with what's going on in our world today, but let me just say a few things as a reminder, in case while on this academic island, uh, you may have just seen the headlines, but have not been able to dive deeply in what's going on in our world. I'm gonna to try to make this as upbeat as possible we know the end of the story, so okay. It will not come as a surprise to you when you dig beyond the headlines to come to understand that the threads of our democracy are unraveling before our eyes. I want you to know that as your commencement speaker, my heart is heavy as I see the rule of law discarded as I see people who I admire and respected and thought would hold the Constitution in high regard or not, as I listen to what's going on in our country right now as the Supreme Court has given us a preview of what might be happening and in all likelihood will happen with Roe versus Wade. And by the way, I did a media interview yesterday, and it was the most difficult thing in the world to get the reporter to understand that my concern was less about abortion rights and more about holding our Constitution in high regard, and that that case was about the Constitution. I watch a little bit of news for my own mental health. I try to limit how much of it I absorb. But it won't take much to watch what's happening with man's inhumanity to man on full display in the Ukraine right now. And I wonder how can any human being watch what's being done to the people of Ukraine and come away from just 15 minutes of watching that on national television and not feel like we as a race of people are spiraling out of control. In case you haven't noticed, graduates, you're going to be facing an incredible economy. Inflation is a real thing. The
The dollars that you earn will have to be stretched further than they have been for decades. The institutional church and its leaders are becoming irrelevant to American life and culture. Let me say that one again for the people in the back. The church is becoming irrelevant. Now, I could spend a full hour, and I promise you I won't, unpacking that one just a little. Francis Schaeffer, one of my favorite theologians, predicted the decline of moral absolutes and the absence of a consensus around a concept called truth. And if you go back and read his writings, what we're experiencing today, he predicted more than a decade ago. Graduates, you're facing the rise of socialism on the far left, but to be sure, you're also witnessing the rise of fascism on the far right. And quite frankly, I have no interest in living under an authoritarian right any more than I have living under an authoritarian left. So all of this, all of this, what does it mean? To borrow a theme from popular culture, the Game of Thrones, which I may or may not have seen a few episodes of, <laughs> leads us to the inescapable conclusion that winter is coming. You saw it too, because you laughed. You knew exactly what that meant. George Martin, who was the creator of the book series on which the show is based, and as is always the case, the book was better, explains that that sentiment says that that dark, cold, stormy periods occur in life. Things may be going well now, summer, but rest assured, winter is coming. And as the House of Stark rulers of the North understood, we must be prepared. Or, to put it in theological terms, Francis Schaeffer said, how should we then live? First of all, let me say that you have taken the best and most important step by completing your education here. So how should we then live? We should live as though we actually know the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We should live as though we believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. We should live as though we actually believe his promises. And I want to go back to what I think your pastor would want you to know this morning if he was here. And it's something that I wish I had learned earlier when I was actually your age. The God that we serve is worthy to be trusted. If you remember anything else this morning, remember that, because y'all are going to be facing some stuff. But the God you've been raised to love is worthy to be trusted. Trust him when the world around you seems to be going mad. Trust him when you don't understand what's going on in world politics. Trust him when you don't get that job you thought you deserved, trust him when he doesn't come up with the ring you thought you were going to get this afternoon after graduation. <laughs> he really is worthy to be trusted. And what that means is you can go through life with a term that I learned from my mother-in-law. When you learn to trust God as you navigate life, you can do it in a state called unbothered. I want you all to practice what it means to be unbothered. 
because you can, because you serve a God who can be trusted. But that's great for you, but what about for the rest of the world? If you in fact believe that God is who he said he is, then you have a moral obligation to share what you know with the world around you. So evangelism is a part of your life. How can you have the keys? How can you have the knowledge? How can you have the wisdom? How can you have the answers? and not share that with a hurting and dire world. Proclaim the gospel of Christ. I want to encourage you to live authentic lives. This also came up in my interview with the reporter yesterday when she asked me, what is the secret to Glenn Youngkin and your political success in Virginia? How did that happen? so that others can duplicate what he did. And my answer to her was, you can't duplicate what he did. He is as authentic as you get. What you see is what you get. And so I want to encourage you to live authentic lives, being true to yourself, being true to what you believe, being true to your moral character. Live a life based on Romans 9. And I would ask you, as you leave this place, to spend your time as though you know that winter is coming. And that's where all the platitudes that usually go along with graduation fall in. You know, today is the first day of the rest of your life. Spend, here's wisdom, spend less than you earn. Some of the old timers may remember Ron Blue, who was one of the first, you know, he was pre-Dave Ramsey. And I met him for the first time and I said, I need some of that financial wisdom that you have. And he looked at me and said, spend less than you earn. And I said, you sell books? You make money telling people that? But it's amazing how much people <laughs> don't honor the simple things. In case you need a word from God, one of the most important things we can do as his people, and you've heard this theme sort of running throughout a lot of what I said today, um, form families. Form families. I mean, it just really makes the other side annoyed and mad. When we get married, have kids, and live happy lives. So live happy lives. I have had the privilege of almost 50 years now of waking up every morning next to my very best friend. It's a great life. Try it. And while you're living those happy lives, please raise strong children. But the last thing that I want to leave you with, and I think it's the most important, is that a lot of people have poured a lot into you. You all have praying grandmothers, parents, spouses, friends. You have college professors who poured their knowledge and wisdom into you. You have had people who've emptied their bank accounts so that you could get this education. You have families that have given all for this happy day. And they did not do that so that you could go out and be mediocre. They did that because they know that you have within you what's going to be required to fight all those things that I mentioned earlier. And that's why I'm excited. That's why I'm not discouraged. I know winter is coming, but I know you're ready for it. So I implore you to go out and be 
disruptive, not mediocre. Take on the fight, take on the challenge, be disruptive. No one gave that blood, sweat, and tears for you to be mediocre. And knowing your professors, knowing the administrators of this university, knowing how I feel as a mother and a grandmother, we are ready to turn all this mess over to you. Thank you. <laughs>